And good morning, everyone out in internet land. This is Yvonne DeVita here in Binghamton, New York, um, where I don't live. I live in Shenango Bridge, but you know, Binghamton is just a hop, skip, and a jump. And um, all the weather and all the, the UPS and all those people think it's Binghamton. Everything is Binghamton, but it's a sunny day. It's actually 31 degrees. It's been, oh, Teresa, it's been like seven and five and the dog has been like I don't care I want to go out <laughs> so you know we'll get out with the dog today for sure this is smart conversations and I have a very special guest her name is Teresa Fritchie and she is a reputation management consultant among many many I when I, I want to read um, her bio for you you're just going to be amazed Teresa welcome to the show thank you so much for having me Yvonne um, and let me, let me just do this little thing here. She's the managing director of, can you pronounce that properly for me? Camarglo. So Camarglo. Communications Marketing Global. Okay, very good. Um, she's been deeply engaged in the practice of communication for 30 years. So she has experience. Her particular expertise is reputation management, and in leveraging her deep knowledge of algorithms, metadata, and crisis management theory to create strategically aligned and fully optimized content that is designed to organically achieve first page search engine results. And this will earn thought leadership and drive revenue in your business. Now, I don't know about you, but Everyone wants, and actually everyone needs, that first page search engine results. So Teresa's passion is found at the convergence, she says, of cybersecurity and reputation. Teresa's career in enterprise technology communications began in 1995 with the creators of the original T3 backbone to the internet and the first VPDN, the first commercial firewall, and the first enterprise-grade mirror hosting. Okay, so I kind of know what those things are, Teresa, <laughs> but I kind of also don't, and I'm like, wow. You know, back in- Yeah, really, really geeky stuff. Yeah, These guys were, was... they were brilliant, absolutely brilliant. IBM, the Merritt Foundation, University of Michigan, they, they built the original T3 backbone to the internet, created the worst first, first commercial firewall. Um, so mirror amazing. hosting at an enterprise level is when you have um, separate locations and your website is actually hosted on both of them. So if there's a denial of service attack, one stays up and you never right. go offline, which right. obviously impacts your reputation. If you are a business that is relying upon having a digital presence, you cannot afford for someone to take your website down. Well, and, and we don't hear about those much anymore, denial of service attacks, but wow, they, they happened a lot back then. Um, are they still happening? They're still happening. Wow. But what you what you wind up having now is um, phishing attacks, um, and, and everybody understands that it, when you're looking at a phishing expedition, P as opposed to F, right, so right, P H I, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. um, this is social engineering at its finest. Mm -hmm. It's designed to the hackers are actually going into and trolling the internet, just mm -hmm. like if you were on the back of a fishing boat mm -hmm. and looking for data that is highly personal. So when they send an email to your employee, mm -hmm. pretending to be a C-suite executive and demanding that a bill get paid because it slipped through processing for last month and is due, the the framework of a phishing attack is very much like a denial of service attack. Mm -hmm. And what bot farms do, frankly, when you suddenly find that something goes viral, it's because the same concepts of a phishing attack and a denial of service attack and a bot farm are all in parallel to take data, manipulate it, ransom it back, 
in one way or another. So while we don't think much about what, other than the headache involved for if we're compromised, right. the in the black web, our personal data is worth about two dollars and fifty cents America, U.S. dollars. Hmm. So on an individual basis, a cyber attack doesn't mean much financially to a hacker for you and I to be part of an attack. But the average number of personal data components of a, an attack, say on Experian, mm -hmm. is almost it is over two billion records. Oh my God! Two two billion records times two dollars and fifty cents suddenly creates an incredible value proposition for cyber criminals, which is wow. why cybersecurity and really strong, resilient policies around patching vulnerabilities is so critical to reputation management. That's yeah. I mean, we're going to talk some more about that, but let me just. Okay finish telling okay. them because this 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 part <laughs> sorry we digressed <laughs> no no um i want them to know that you were an early adopter of social media platforms and you recognize the almost collective absence of strategic planning and corporate communication best practices in managing digital assets um that is really one of the most important things is i think nobody still recognizes that um, so let me go Very on. True. Proving her expertise and the viability of social media marketing, three months after the legal incorporation of Camarglo, she delivered an unprecedented U.S. 100 million in measurable impact global DMO destination marketing organization campaign, which included in excess of 26 million impressions on Twitter in a single week. I'm just, my, my brain is, it's, it's, it's almost, it's almost 3,700 tweets in the space of a single week. Um, unbelievable. Um, Teresa is a dynamic <laughs> keynote speaker who has challenged C-suite and board level audiences to rethink cybersecurity budgets and risk management in terms of reputation and to embrace the shifting communication silo offered by social media. She's a native of Western New York, just like me and her ability to educate, engage, and entertain developed working as, developed when she was working as an international tour guide in Niagara Falls. Oh, yep. I, do you know, Teresa, I lived in Rochester my whole life, but I never went to Niagara Falls until I was about 25. I don't know, I was like old. But at least you got to one of the seven wonders of the world and you did see it. Yeah, I did. I, I was a hop, skip and a jump and I did. And I got in trouble for it too. But anyway, that's a whole other story. Uh, she, she was a tour guide at Niagara Falls while studying communications at the University of Buffalo. She's an evocative writer whose blog is read in over 200 countries. And she's the author of a book, All That I Need, or Live Like a Dog With Its Head Stuck Out the Car Window. So, I mean, that is like one of the greatest bios that I've ever had the, the pleasure to share with people because it really encompasses not just how smart and talented you are and how necessary for the kinds of things that are happening today, like denial of service attacks and reputation management, but it shows the other side of you who is this woman who was willing to share her musings um, about life in a book. So ladies and gentlemen, I mean, I give you Teresa Fritchie and Teresa, you know, you touched a little bit um, while I was reading your bio on the whole concept of reputation management and how important it is. But I want to go into both the social media aspect and we do not want to end this without talking about um, metadata. So which one do you Absolutely. want to start with? Well, let's, let's, let me create a, a metaphor for you. Okay. If we think about metadata in terms of the foundation of your digital house, until if you're building a physical building 
and it's five stories tall. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a substructure that will support the physical weight of that building. Right. Metadata is the substructure of your digital presence online. Wow. It's very much, if you were all of an age where we grew up going into a library, using a card catalog and plucking out one specific book that got us to the research that we needed to do for a term paper. Yeah. So you need to think about metadata like it's that single card in the card catalog that's going to get you to that vast environment of all the information in the world that is available on the internet. No one can find you without that metadata being fully optimized. They just can't. You can write anything you want in the back end of your website, but it's the keywords that you would find at the bottom of a card catalog, biography, the Middle East, history, um, uh, history of Gertrude Bell, by mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. So Gertrude Bell was a contemporary of Lawrence of Arabia. She spoke multiple languages. She had was vetted by sheiks in the Middle East when women weren't allowed in Victorian England to travel outside of their own homes. Wow. And she was a spy, oh. which a lot of people don't know, but she was a spy previous to World War I breaking out. So if you think of Gertrude Bell's card catalog in the Dewey Decimal System in the library, and you were building a website around Gertrude Bell, you would include metadata that was Middle East, history, espionage, World War I. So, but you wouldn't necessarily include the title of Gertrude Bell's book. Interesting. Because people are going to be searching for history of the Middle East. They're going to be searching for espionage. They're going to be searching for World War I. So what you want to do when you're looking at your metadata and subsequently your, the keywords, and we'll, we'll talk about keywords and optimization a little later on, is build a foundation that is rock solid against who you want to be your target audience. Mm. And that's where the strategic alignment with your business objectives becomes so critical. You can, you can write an art direction brief for a website. But unless the C-suite and the board of directors is actually taking the time to sit down and do a debrief with your chief communications officer, your chief marketing officer, so that they can intelligently brief the web designers, there's going to be a chronic this yeah, misfiring missing. between operational objectives and what your external communications are doing. So when, when we say metadata, yep, that's a term that not a lot of people understand. And, and you can explain it as the foundation, but it's, it's the, the HTML, isn't it? The, it's one or two lines of code of HTML. Yeah. And so if you if you if you go to your mouse and you right click on your website you there will be a, a menu that says view source code mm -hmm. when you open up that window and you scroll down you will see meta tags mm -hmm. that's your metadata anything else that's there you don't really need to care so much about for this conversation so how does the metadata get there somebody codes it there it's a it's a decision made by whoever is driving the development of your website on what language gets put in the metadata okay so i have a website and i just write in it i've nobody's ever looked at my metadata including me i have 
<laughs> we'll talk about that later. Yeah. But yeah, I I have looked at your source code. Well, and so, but this is the the key here is I would not want to touch that because I'm afraid of HTML, except the very basic how to bold, how to italicize, all of those little things that I know how right. to do. I would this is more I, this is more important than your italicizing and your bold. Yes, yes, it is, but I'm afraid to touch it. So are you the person you? that created your own website? Um, well, my husband Tom? created the site, but all he did was put the site up and I do all the writing. Okay. Well, um, he put the site up, mm -hmm. so he knows to get to the metadata, even if you don't. Yes. So I, will work, I will work with Tom to get your metadata straightened out. Uh, I you know, and I think that's why I have no traffic and Google doesn't know I exist. <laughs> well, and it's, but, it, and this goes to the next chapter of this. So yeah. the metadata is your poured concrete foundation yes. with the steel beams okay. enforced in it, okay? Your keywords, mm -hmm. your content, your search engine optimization have to be aligned with your, your strategic business objectives. Okay. So all of those words that you choose to describe today's today's um, Zoom call, by example, mm -hmm. right? It's mm -hmm. it's what we're describing isn't nurturing. It's strategic communications, right? It's reputation management. It's corporate consulting. And probably a half a dozen other things, but here's the, the really critical point to understand is that when you post something to LinkedIn, their spiders, which mm -hmm. is a, 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 tied to their algorithms, they will only pick up the first three hashtags in any post. And if you're not hashtagging those words, they're not going to pick them up as keywords and subsequently because linkedin is owned by microsoft which also owns bing uh -huh. you are not going to show up on bing search results well, same goes with google has a strategic relationship with twitter so if you don't understand how to use hashtag words appropriately on the twitter platform you're never going to migrate the content that is again, tied to your metadata mm -hmm. into Google search results. So, so, so in, in LinkedIn and Twitter, yeah. I've been seeing, and this is, to me, this is new, people using the hashtags in their sentence structure as opposed to at the end. Yeah, well, here's, I have always written that way. I treat oh. writing always. First off, um, the latter of just dumping the hashtag words at the end is lazy. Yeah. It's lazy posting. And I can tell when I see that, that somebody is relying upon HubSpot to dump their content. They'll take the time to actually go to HubSpot and, lo and other MarTech solutions, load in all the content that they want to have there, with the keywords that they have selected and the time that they want to cascade this information, because maybe, okay, they have a meeting scheduled at that time and there's a conflict. But what winds up happening because the sentence structure isn't optimized and you've got all of your keywords hashtagged at the bottom of it, you're using the same keywords over and over and over and over and over again, instead of, unique keywords for each piece of content. So, but unique keywords for each piece of content. So if I'm writing content relevant to my business, which is um, helping people write books and publish them on Kindle KDP, I would be using the same words over again, publishing, writing, books. Yes and no. You would be using books you would be using authors you would be there's a difference between an author and a writer mm -hmm. which we both understand yeah um self-publishing is different than publishing mm -hmm. 
being a book coach is different than being an editor. Yep. Right. So you have, let's say you have a, like in anything, you have a portfolio of keywords. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a dozen. And as if, I have to understand that I came out of traditional corporate public relations. Right. And my original um, coursework at university was journalism, broadcast, and speech. So the five W's and how are critical. Mm -hmm. If you can't answer that in your content, why are you publishing any content on a social platform to begin with? And it should never ever be about selling. Your share, social media is about sharing mm -hmm. and in building your reputation online it is much more important to be sharing as opposed to trying to sell. And I see people who are so-called influencers, this is just a misnomer a thousand times over, who might have 3 million people following them but when they are publishing content because they make a business out of publishing content for other people to expose them to their three million followers, mm -hmm. there's, they're not optimizing that content because they've hired junior, and this is not an offense to any 20 year old that grew up with two phones in their hand, but there's a difference between thinking strategically about the content and actually posting content. But, but if, Two things. Um, when I see someone's content that I want to share, so it isn't right. always about writing and publishing. It could be some of your content because Which reputation management done. is yeah. hugely it, it, it ticked, important to an author, right? Yeah, it ticked, it ticked a box. So I would, I try to grab the hashtags that that person has been using. Perfect. Okay. So then secondly, if these influencers who have 5 million followers and they're getting paid to talk about a product. Why do they care? They're getting paid. This they is their don't. Money. Don't the, don't the, the corporate entities look at it and say, hey, that wasn't working. What are we going to do? Yeah, they unfortunately have a, a lot of marketing departments have bought a bill of goods that an influencer is going to have an interest in their business. And yeah. the reality is an influencer is only in their, interested in their business and putting money in their pocket. Yeah. So does anybody really believe that any of the Kardashians care about selling, whether it's Pepsi or Coke? They no, do not. It, that, that is a really good point, but I will tell you when we were running blog pause, yeah. Um, our bloggers would not accept content or products from companies they didn't approve of. And, and they didn't approve right. of and a whole lot of companies. It's called integrity. And there's a huge difference between yeah. somebody who's prostituting their personal brand for financial gain and somebody who is putting content out because they're authentic transparent and genuinely interested right. in that content. So then we get to reputation management because yeah. sometimes you put out that content and it gets you in trouble. What do you do? Well, we've got a couple of examples the last yeah. two weeks, haven't we? Yeah. Um, you know, the Spotify brouhaha, which is yeah. not going to go away anytime soon is primarily an, a lack of transparency around the core principles of the C-suite. Yeah. And in not having, you know, that there, I don't wanna slam my colleagues who are chief communications officers, but in fairness, you can't say, I don't necessarily agree with these policies as Dusty, whatever her last name is, that's the mm -hmm. Spotify head of um, PR on a global basis mm -hmm. has done. <laughs> you don't get to say that and have your audience believe that you are operating from a position of integrity when it comes to disinformation that has literally killed 
millions of people on a global basis. And so what we have learned in, you know, in the context of ESGs and SDGs, uh, that the, the stakeholder, the external stakeholder, whether they're shareholders or not, has the ability to move mountains in our cancel culture. Spotify lost four billion in market capitalization this last week in the matter of two days mm. because of Neil Lang Young's decision to pull his catalog because of Joe Rogan's misinformation mm -hmm. guess. Yeah. And so now you have um, Daniel Alp, who is the, one of the co-founders of Spotify, making an ambiguous statement yeah. that has absolutely no value yeah. to Spotify's reputation. Exactly. And he's basically patting everybody on the head and saying, you know, the guy's worth $3.8 billion US dollars before Spotify started to tank. So, you know, he's 38 years old. Mm -hmm. it, it, he never has to worry about money ever again in his life. But the reality is, is that Spotify is losing its credibility with musicians because they have taken this position on a podcast. Mm -hmm. There's 4 million podcasts on a global basis, yours included. Joe Rogan has built an incredible, whether you agree with what he right. talks about or not, mm -hmm. he knows his audience. Yeah. So, so Spotify has had to make a decision. They spent $100 million to have him exclusively on Spotify. They rolled the dice and figured, okay, we're going to stick by our investment. Now, the, it, does your return on investment of that hundred million justify losing four billion for your shareholders? And I would say no, it does not. Right. That's right. erroneous reputation management. Yeah, pretty bad. So, in the other one in the news, <laughs> well, Boris Johnson, Novik Dovashek. I mean, you know, where do you, if you're going to tell a lie, be smart enough not to have your government backdate a COVID test to try and get you into a government, another country on a visa to play. And then like, here's my, my issue over the whole debacle over the Australian tennis open and how his family, because he does not, it should be noted, that Novak's father and his uncle are his spokespeople. Mm, yeah. This is not a smart way to manage your reputation. Admittedly, it's very cultural. The Balkans consistently do this where, you know, you don't argue with the patriarchal society and, and right. holding this, right? But instead of doubling or tripling or quadrupling down, both Spotify and Novak and his family had the opportunity to say, you know what, we should just come clean on this. Admit we made a mistake, handle it from a crisis management perspective with authenticity and integrity and move on. Your stock will rebound, your, your credibility within your sporting community would rebound, but all too often we're afraid of actually admitting we made a mistake. Owning our mistakes, owning the responsibility attached to the fallout of those. Think about Tylenol, by example, you know, when the tampering existed in the 90s over, right? Mm -hmm. Tylenol got in front of it. They didn't mess around because Johnson and Johnson had a huge reputation stake at, at play. They did a total recall. When you get in front of your reputation from a crisis management perspective, it's because somebody has sat down with the risk management people, with the chief financial officer, with the board of directors and said, these are the various scenarios and all of this is playing out in real time 
on the internet, you don't have an option of two or three days. You have to get in front of this. And shame on anybody who isn't managing their online presence accordingly. It takes no effort to issue a one paragraph media advisory that's based on sound judgment. Talk to your corporate attorneys, talk to your risk management people, talk to your insurance company, figure out what it's gonna cost you if you don't address this, but get in front of it and make a public statement. Yeah, well, not enough. Not enough people seem to understand that. Um, and we could go on and on and on. It's time it yeah. come to the end of the show. And Sorry. Um, <laughs> What, what, before we sign off, do you want people to know about, um, let's, let's end with risk management itself of what we've been talking about. The average person, um, we see these things happening and we don't know what to make of it. We, I mean, I mean, as you said, if, if these, uh, people could just say I made a mistake, well, well, um, Boris, um, Johnson from the UK went on and said, I'm sorry, I made a mistake, but his mistake was too big to get over. Well, and the, if you looked at the words involved, very disingenuous. Yes. So He's, he made a mistake that he got caught, not yes. that he made a mistake. Well, well, so There's a what, huge difference between the two. What can so you his, tell us that, that you do that um, kind of for the small business owner or the corporate um, entity who, who, who knows, we'll, we'll send this out everywhere. What should they expect if they work with someone like you? Okay. Um, the very first thing that they need to expect is that, and we referenced it before, is that I am going to go and look at the under, the, under your petticoat and at the back of the house on your metadata. I'm going to look at all of your presence on various social media channels. See what is optimized. Are you taking full advantage of all of the character space on a biography? Is that optimized? Is your content in alignment with what you tell me your strategic business objectives are? And then the first phase of fixing all of this is to bring those into alignment. It's about a five week process to get the search engines massaged so that they're picking up the new content, but it's, I make this very clear. There are no quick fixes. If someone is selling you a package of 60 new posts, but they're not optimizing your metadata and they're not listening to what your strategic business objectives are, then you are wasting $10,000. And I could point immediately to somebody who's just sent out a bulk LinkedIn message soliciting new business and $9,995 US dollars for 60 posts one long length blog post, an hour long interview with your C-suite. These are not things that are going to inherently fix your positioning in the first page of any search engine on a global basis. The things that fix that go back to crisis management theory. You wanna flood the network with fully optimized content that is completely aligned with the metadata and your strategic objectives. And that takes a, a, a real strategic communications plan based on old fashioned public relations, editorial calendars, what's happening at a corporate level, what's happening at a product level, what's happening at a personal level, mm -hmm. what's happening from a sales perspective, and then just absolutely sharing information that's relevant to your vertical. So let me offer this to your watchers. Normally, this, what I've just described about doing an online audit would be about 5,000 US dollars. That includes an hour long conversation with you to discuss strategically what you want to accomplish out of your digital assets. And then I do the audit. We come back together. We talk about key objectives for the next 90 days. And then I frame it up the scope of work. I will offer that online audit and scope of, you know, the initial scope of work to fix this 
to your viewership for two thousand dollars well that is really pretty darn generous and um we'll make sure that in the blog post that's described properly so that people can then get in touch with you um because it seems to me that i i I mean, everyone should be doing this and they're not. Yeah. And you have compliance issues around privacy. You know, in Europe, we have GDPR. Mm -hmm. In the United States, you're supposed to have an S after your HTTP right. so that it is a secure website so your data can't be hacked. That also requires you doing regular maintenance to the back end of your website to ensure that if you have add-ons and applications that are running on your website, that you have security patches from your third-party providers so your supply chain of software is secure. It's not just reputation management from a don't say the wrong thing. It's this really understanding that the cybersecurity piece of this is just one of 80 components of building reputation and trust, but it is a critical one. If your customers and your audience can't trust what you are doing with their data, they will go someplace else to do business. And that is the truth. So um, this will all be written up and shared. And um, Teresa, this has really been so fan fantastic and it's a subject you so much. and you know so much about it that i'm tempted to say we need to bring you back to talk a little bit deeper into some of the pieces that you talked about because i would be happy to do that and let's do this if we're going to why don't you ask your audience if they have questions to submit them to you in advance so that we can address some of we'll the more do. pressing concerns that people might have but I'm, yeah, we'll I'm happy to have another conversation with you anytime, Yvonne. I, I'm, I'm privileged and I'm honored. So this is Yvonne DeVita signing off from um, Smart Conversations. And by golly, you learned a lot today. Um, and so we'll, we'll bring Teresa back, I promise. Thanks, Yvonne.